The concept of stress has been previously introduced as the intensity of internal forces inside the solid material. Here we dig deeper into the stress concept by reviewing various types of stresses that are developed in a solid body, along with their application in various load-carrying structures. First, let's look into normal stress and shear stress. Stress in general is calculated as a force divided by area. Any force acting on a section could be projected into a force perpendicular to a section and a force parallel to it. Materials typically show different strength level depending on the direction of the force with respect to the cross-section area. To distinguish between these cases and describe stresses more accurately, two stress categories are defined as normal stress and shear stress. If the force is perpendicular to the section, either inward or outward, the produced stress is called normal stress. If the force is parallel to the section, it will develop shear stress. The normal stress is typically shown by Greek letter sigma, and shear stress is typically shown by Greek letter ta. Both are calculated as force divided by area. The only difference is the direction of the applied force. Note that normal stress always exists on two opposite faces with the same magnitude but opposite direction in order to maintain equilibrium of the element. In a similar way, if shear stress exists on one side of stress element, other three faces would have the same amount of stress. Stress directions should be in a way that arrowheads and tails match with each other, otherwise the equilibrium is not satisfied on the stress element. The third type of stress is bearing stress. There are many cases in engineering applications where two separate bodies are in contact with each other, transferring the force from one to another. Stress in such cases reflects the intensity of the force not internally within a body, but in the contact area between two separate bodies. The intensity of internal force that is developed on the contact area of two separate bodies is called the bearing stress. Bearing stress has many applications in engineering because many engineering structures are made of various components that are in contact with each other. Note that the bearing stress is not a separate stress category, but is a special case of normal stress. So, it is calculated as force divided by area at which the force is acting on. Bearing stress is typically shown by sigma sub b, where subscript b stands for bearing. Now let's review some examples to better understand various types of stresses that are developed in structures. The first example is a punch problem that we have already solved the beginning part of that. Based on what we have learned, we now can identify that the stress that is developed between the punch and the plate is a bearing stress because this is stress that is developed between two separate bodies. But in addition to that stress, another stress will be developed when the hydraulic punch is pressing the plate and making a slot in the plate. In that case, the plate is going to be sheared along its thickness. And because the force is parallel to the cross-section area, it is producing shear stress. In order to determine the cross-section area, we need to determine the perimeter of the slug and multiply that by the thickness. The perimeter of the slug consists of two lines with the length of L on the top and on the bottom and two half circles. The perimeter of a circle is going to be pi multiplied by D, so the total perimeter of slug is going to be 2L plus pi multiplied by D. And the side area of the slug is going to be the perimeter multiplied by the thickness. And shear stress? is simply determined by dividing the force over the cross-section area. So by this example, we wanted to see the different types of stresses that could be developed within one structure. In the next examples, we are going to look into more complicated cases. The next example is a pen connection that is very common in structural engineering. We review the stresses developed in the connecting members to have a better understanding on how the force is passed through the connecting elements and how stresses are developed in those elements. To make the calculation simpler, we just focus on the connecting element, which in this case is the gusset plate, shown in blue, and three bolts that connecting the I-shaped beam to the support. The axial force F that is passing through the gusset plate to the left support is perpendicular to the gusset plate, so it is producing normal stress. Stress is going to be force divided by area. Area, as shown in this figure, is the thickness multiplied by the height of section and we call it A sub G because this is the gross cross-section area or the total cross-section area of the gusset plate. 
Stress is simply force divided by area. But this is not the critical stress on this section, because the connecting bolts that are passing through the gusset plates are creating holes on the gusset plate, reducing the effective cross-section area. In order to calculate the stress on the net cross-section area, which is the gross cross-section area minus the area of the holes, we simply subtract the area of the holes from the gross cross-section area. Area of one hole is equal to its diameter multiplied by the thickness of the plate, and the total area of the holes would be equal to the number of bolts multiplied by area of one hole. And in that case, the effective cross-section area, or the net cross-section area, is equal to A sub G minus N multiplied by the thickness multiplied by the diameter. And normal stress would be simply force divided by area. In that case, we use sigma sub n to emphasize that this stress is produced on the net cross-section area. And this stress is going to be larger than the previous stress because the same amount of force is divided by smaller cross-section area. Another stress that is developed in the gusset plate is between the bolt and the plate. This stress is called bearing stress because it is developed between two separate bodies. The bolts connecting the I-beam to the gusset plate push the plate at the contact area of the bolt and the gusset plate. If this stress is more than the strength of the gusset material, the plate will deform and make the hole larger. After reaching a certain limit, the plate fails. The contact area where the bolt is sitting on is a half circle, and stresses that are developed on the contact surface are non-uniform, making the calculation more difficult. In order to simplify the calculation, while ensuring safety, the minimum area, which is the rectangular projection of that half circle, is considered. So area in this case for one hole would be equal to the diameter multiplied by the thickness. And because there are three bolts here, the total bearing area is going to be equal to the number of bolts multiplied by the diameter multiplied by the thickness. And bearing stress is simply force divided by area. Note that the bearing stress in the plate and the bolt is the same, and the one made of weaker material yields earlier. The bolt rupture is undesirable mode of failure, as it's typically sudden without any sign. So it is common practice in engineering design to make the bolts from material that is stronger than the one used for making the connecting plates to prevent failure in the connecting bolts. So in this case, there is no need to check stress in the bolt and checking stress in the gusset plate is sufficient. The third type of stress is shear stress in the bolts. The force passing through the bolts is parallel to the cross-section area of the bolt, producing shear stress. The cross-section area of each bolt is equal to pi over 4 diameter squared, and total cross-section area is going to be number of bolts, or n, multiplied by the area of one bolt. And shear stress in the bolt would be force divided by area. So in this simple example, we just wanted to explain various types of stresses that are developed in a simple pin connection. In the next example, we study another pin connection and review the same types of stresses, but in a different configuration. In this connection, a wood plate on the right is connecting by a bolt to two wood plates on the left. And we want to determine the amount of stresses developed in the connection in two different cases. In case one, an external force of P is applied to the right side and is transferred to the left side. In a second case, there is no external force, but the knot is tightened so that an internal stress of 2700 PSI is developed in the bolt. And we want to determine what kind of stresses are developed in that case and how much are the magnitude of those stresses. Let's start with the normal stress developed in the board. The board is going to break on the critical cross-section area, which is the section passing through the holes. The net cross-section area is determined by subtracting the area of the hole from the gross cross-section area. The gross cross-section area is the width multiplied by the thickness, B multiplied by T, and the area of the hole is the diameter multiplied by the thickness, D multiplied by T. And normal stress developed on the net cross-section area is simply force divided by area. Here we just consider the right wood board because it would have the less cross-section area. The bearing stress is again calculated on the right wood board because of the lower area that results in a higher stress compared to the left board. The bearing stress on the half circle contact surface is non-uniform, but similar to the previous problem, for simplicity, the average stress is calculated on a projected 
rectangular contact area between the bolt and the wood board. The area of the projected rectangular section is equal to the diameter of the hole multiplied by the thickness. And bearing stress, which is assumed to be uniformly distributed on that rectangular section, is simply force divided by area. The calculation of the shear stress is a bit different from what we did in the previous example. In this case, the force is transferred to the wood boards on the top and on the bottom. So each bolt is sheared on two planes, as shown in this figure. This connection is called a double shear connection. In general, the shearing area is equal to the number of bolts, which in this case is 1, multiplied by the number of shearing planes, which in this case is 2, one plane on top and one plane on the bottom, multiplied by the cross-section area of the bolt, which is pi diameter squared over 4. And shear stress is again simply force divided by the shearing area. Now let's look into case 2, where there is no external force, but the force is developed internally due to the tightening of the nut. In that case, the internal stress that is given in the bolt could be used for the calculation of the internal force. Stress is a force divided by area. Area of the bolt is pi diameter squared over 4. So if we multiply the given stress by the area of the bolt, we can determine how much is the internal force developed in the system. This internal force is going to be transferred to the wood board through the washer. The washer is actually spreading this force over a larger area. The area of the washer is equal to pi over 4 external diameter squared minus internal diameter squared. And stress is simply force over area. This is bearing stress because the washer is sitting on the wood board transferring the force from one element to another element. Now let's compare the bearing stress in this case with the case where the nut is directly sitting on the wood board. The dimension of half an inch zinc finish hex nut could be obtained from the hex nut table. The internal and external diameters are used for the calculation of the contact area of the nut and the wood board. The area of the nut is approximated with a circle fitting the nut with an external diameter of 3 quarter of inch and internal diameter of half an inch. So the area is going to be pi over 4, 3 quarter of inch squared minus half an inch squared. And the bearing stress in that case is again force divided by area. As we can see from this example, the bearing stress without the washer is about 10 times higher than the bearing stress when the washer is used in the connection. So this simple example emphasizes the importance of the washer in the bolt connection to avoid stress concentration and local failure. If the washer is not used in the connection, the stress developed between the knot and the wood board might be too high that cause local failure in the wood board. As a take away from this example, let's look into the double shear connection that we saw. A connecting bolt could be sheared on more than one plane depending on the number of plates that are connected by each bolt. In the simplest case, if the bolt is connecting two plates, each bolt is sheared on one plane and it's called the single shear connection. If the bolt is connecting two plates to another one, the bolt is sheared on two planes and it is called a double shear connection. In a similar way, a triple shear connection or more could be defined. Note that the shear connection is independent from the number of bolts and only depends on how many planes are sheared in each bolt. A double shear connection is more efficient than a single shear connection because the force split on two planes instead of one, which increases the shearing area and results in a less shear stress in the bolt. All right, so by looking at these two examples, we just wanted to learn more about different types of stresses and how to calculate them in different cases. There are more examples that you can practice and learn more about different types of stresses. I will put a link down below in the description. Thank you very much, and I will see you in the next lecture.